You know what I love about this church? Ryan is helping us uh, with the stage hand here. I love that he's so lost. He's so lost in worship that I have to like get his attention. And that's really what we're trying to do here. I think with that song is just give the Lord whatever he wants. This is all about the Lord's work in our lives. And this is all about the Lord himself as a person. And so, uh, what's not good this morning? Look, I know you all have bad attitudes because it's winter. I know. But what God has done uh, is just a precursor to what God is going to do. And uh, I have a special guest this morning, uh, a friend of mine. The, the team knows what's coming. Uh, and this is Pastor Anthony Greco from Calgary Life Church. And um, I want you to shout him down. I want you to come in and tell me after, like, oh my goodness, he can really preach and whatever. It's okay. Um, there are a few people in my life who are uh, like spiritual mentors to me, and Pastor Anthony is one of them. And uh, the reason that we have this church building here, actually, a large part of that reason is because Pastor Anthony hurt, hurt my feelings one time. And he said to me, and he said to me, this is before COVID, he said, until you have a building, and somebody told him this, you're nothing until you have a building because the devil can get you out in a week, I think you said. I think you said a week, something like that. And then COVID uh, happened and during the entirety of COVID, in my mind, all I could hear was Pastor Anthony's words, just like, until you have a building, you're nothing. So thank you for those encouraging words. But what it did was it pushed us into, and this is the kind of church we are. Pastor Corey, by the way, if we haven't met, come and meet um, me and my wife, Erin, there. We planted the church about five years ago. And uh, what God has been able to do here has been largely in part of uh, some spiritual mentors that uh, I have and friends. We don't hang out all the time, but when we do, I normally talk all the time, but when I'm with him, I let him do the talking. And he's Italian, so he doesn't mind. And uh, so I want you to welcome to this stage Pastor Anthony Greco from Calgary Life Church. So I've just kind of given him permission to do whatever he feels like the Holy Spirit wants him to do. We'll just facilitate you. And we love you so much, you and your lovely wife and your church. Uh, it's been a blessing. What I love about um, Pastor Anthony is that he's a kingdom-minded person. And uh, we don't ever want to be in a competitive space in churches because we're all doing the same work. And so he's doing a great work in Calgary. And he's traveled all over the world. And so we're uh, glad to partner with you in any way that we can help you. And you help us already so much. And so we are uh, partners with you and we are brothers with you. And so awesome. we love you. Come on. Come on. Awesome. Thank you. Hey. Venue Church, look at you. This is awesome. And uh, I'm just so absolutely honored to be here with Pastor uh, Corey and Aaron. I just, uh, I, I knew, you know, Corey's father. That's, you know, I'm a little bit old school. I know I look really young, but I started when I was like five. And uh, it's just fantastic to be here and uh, to see what you've done. In five years, you've got your building in five years. Okay, look, listen, you know, you've got to thank God for this couple because... That, that's, a, that's a rare story in Canada, is to have a couple that started from scratch and built a building and is in multiple services and it's going to go multi-location. That is absolutely, look around you, this is not by fluke or it just happened. This is the product of faith, wisdom, dedication, sacrifice, and a word from God. So can you give it up for your pastors? I just love getting to know them, and uh, I'm glad I get to be a part of the venue story. I think it's absolutely remarkable, and you guys grew during COVID. You know, I feel like I'm so glad that I can come and say, yeah, so did we. You know, but that, and it's kind of like, it feels good, but most churches I talk to, yeah, we're still 30% behind, and we're even further behind financially, and, and I'm just like, oh yeah, it's been tough, you know. And, uh, but it's so, but it, I, I think that COVID, has been one of the greatest things that helped us. You know, I'm sorry for people that got sick or those that lost their lives and jobs and things like that, but I tell you, it's prepared people to be spiritually open like never before. This is the time for the church to be solid, to be grounded, to be loud, to be preaching Jesus, to open up the doors. And I love the venue spirit. You guys, you know, when I was talking to your pastor before and he said, you know, we're, we're high challenge people. I remember one time I did communion service with beef jerky. 
I got the oldest, toughest beef jerky I could find. And I just, and, and, and instead of being really liturgical, I just had them tear a chunk off and say, you can't make it tough enough. I don't know if it's biblical, but it, it communicated what I want, you know. So let me just give you a, a brief introduction about myself. I got some photos uh, of my family here. And so uh, there's a picture of my wife and I, and uh, she's hot. We, uh, we met in India on the mission field. And uh, it was interesting because I had been banned from India, but by a miracle I got back in. And then uh, when I saw her being a little Italian guy, you know, it's blonde Swede. So I, I, she came to the table where I was sitting and I accidentally put my feet on hers because the Bible says, whatever the soles of your feet shall tread upon that I've given you, says the Lord. So I, she wanted nothing to do with me. Like she's, she's kind of crouching down a little bit there. She's actually taller than me. And, uh, and I'm like this. And as you can see, I never changed my clothes. Uh, and uh, I just go from a, a crew neck to a V-neck. And uh, it's about as far as I go. And uh, so I pursued her for nine months. She wanted nothing to do with me. My motto was through faith and flowers, all things are possible. And, you know, I mean, I was really going after her. And uh, today they'd call that stalking. Anyway, we got engaged in Nigeria about a year later. And uh, we got four kids. And I think I'll get some pictures of my kids. She started throwing the photo. That's my daughter, Angelina. And uh, she's in her third year psychology. She's the youngest. I've got three sons and a daughter. And uh, she's in psychology because she, works, she gets to live with case studies. And uh, then this is me and my boys on a fly fishing trip we did down in Montana. Alex on the far left. He's my creative uh, director at CLC. Gabriel with the... Well, see, that's my Swedish Jesus and my Italian Jesus. <laughs> The Italian Jesus Gabriel, he's married to a South African Amy. They live in Vancouver. She's been part of the, uh, uh, in the, in the animation department of a large studio out there. And so if you saw Super Pets, uh, you know, with Keanu Reeves and Dwayne The Rock Johnson, she was a part of that. So uh, uh, Myrtle the Turtle, whatever the turtle's name was, that was like her character. And that's my son Ben, who's uh, on the very left there. He's my youngest boy. He's uh, in charge of our TV and video. And he's flying out to, moving out to Vancouver, part of Vancouver Film School in the new year so we're gonna miss him and uh all right so that next photo whatever comes up let's see that's my cat missy anybody want a cat i'm trying to get rid of this thing uh i hate cats i love dogs dogs are god's gift cats you know anyway they're feral okay just next one then i'll sh tell you about some of the things that we do one of the things i started something called mission 316 where we're going to uh, gospel but areas where the gospel is not yet preached or is a, it, they're gospel starved. And so we found a place in Tanzania called Shinyanga, which is in a remote area. There was 1,200 known believers and a lot of Muslims. And so we went in and we did a, a dinner with all the Muslim leaders. That's with me and two, two of the sheikhs that were there. The one on my right was the, the head sheikh of that region, Sheikh Belilusa. So we do a friendship dinner. The first night, I invite all the politicians. I get the governor there, members of parliament. Parliament, all the Muslim leaders. I got to keep the Christians out because they always ruin it. You know, they want to argue. They want to. And I'm there. This is a friendship dinner. We eat with the, we eat with them, and then I preach Jesus from the Quran. You know, and I begin to have an approach with them. I say, look, there's a lot that we disagree on, but let's start with what we agree on. Your holy book and my holy book speak of Isa al Masih. We call him Jesus, you call him Isa. Your book says he's born of a virgin, my book says he's born of a virgin. Your book says he's coming back, my book says he's coming back. Your book says he's the word of God made flesh, my book says he's the word of God made flesh. Your book says he's sinless, my book says he's sinless. Your book speaks of prophet Yahya, which is John the Baptist, and he said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So that's how I start with them. And then I give them my word that, hey, we're gonna have a festival. Everybody's in welcome. I will not speak against your prophet. I will not speak against your holy book. And our prayers will be without discrimination. And if Esau wants to heal a blind Muslim man or a deaf Muslim woman, no discrimination. And so I think I got a picture of a blind man that got healed in this. And there's a man that's been blind. I said, touch my nose, which is daring. And uh, so then by the end, we started with 1,200 people. And I think we have the altar call. That's the altar call on the last night. But the story doesn't end there. So what do I, what, what I do after that is I have another dinner 
with the Muslim leaders. Now they've seen me in action for four days. I haven't mentioned anything negative about any other religion. I've just lifted up Jesus. And uh, so anyway, then, you know, Sheikh Balilusa, he was amazed. He said, you know, as Muslims, we have so misunderstood Jesus. So thank you for reintroducing Jesus. Because he's mentioned in the Quran 98 times. And Muhammad is only mentioned twice. And uh, so when you start talking from a friendship perspective, you see incredible results. And so that's a little bit what we do overseas. We're heading off this year to uh, Madagascar, and then we're going to be going to uh, Ambon, Indonesia, where the Muslims just burnt down dozens of churches and killed 120 people. I thought, let's go and do a friendship festival. And so, hey, if you got your uh, life insurance up to date and you want to come with me, I'll be going in August to Indonesia, no, November in Indonesia and August in Madagascar. And so, anyway, I'd love to have you come and be a part of that. Pastor Corey, you, when we do, we do leadership seminars, you should come and begin to teach because we're working with a lot of young pastors over there. So that's a bit about us. And so let me get right into the word. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that your word never returns to you void. Father, I pray that every person that's watching online or listening right now, they would hear a voice within my voice, your voice, Jesus. Thank you for hearts being prepared, ready to see the implanted word which has the power to bring transformation thank you father for each and every person that's here today they're not here by accident holy spirit i pray that you begin to speak to them in jesus name help me god i need your grace amen all right well when pastor Corey called me and said uh you know would you come and do a christmas message and as pastors I find Christmas the hardest time to preach. How many times can you tell them, you know, there's no room at the inn? It's like, you know, it's like, you know, so I was so glad that I could slip away from my church so I didn't have to do, I can cut down the number of Sundays for Christmas messages. And that's why I said yes. No, I said, I said yes because I believe in what you're doing here and I love your pastors and I consider this an honor to be here and to share this word. So today, I want to uh, share a message with you. Uh, I'm calling it, there's something about Mary. And it's about Mary is the penultimate missionary because she brought Jesus into the world. And I want to speak a message because I believe prophetically that you and I have the same calling. We're called to, to, to carry a God idea and to bring Jesus into our world. Can I hear a good amen? And when you think about the Christmas story, you know, we always have this romantic picture of it. But really, uh, it's not really romantic, is it? It's rather ridiculous. It starts with scandal. A teenage girl gets pregnant out of wedlock. And she's engaged to this guy who wants to divorce her. And then they got to go for a census. And, and then Joseph, the big dummy, forgets to call Expedia.com and book a room. There's not, he should be fired. Like, there should be a, something about that in the story. You know, Mary, Mary calling him a big dope or something. And a baby is born in a smelly manger. Like, it's a crazy story. And, and maybe in your season right now, it's kind of crazy what's going on around you. But I want to give you some hope this morning. So let's open up to Luke chapter 1. I'm going to read from verse 26 all the way to 45. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along or it might come up on the screen. Now in the sixth month, the, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that holy one who is to be born will be called the son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who, is called, who was called barren. 
For with God, nothing will be impossible. Come on, can we say with God, nothing will be impossible together? For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah. And entered a house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And when it, hap and it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, that the babe leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Awesome. There's your Christmas story right there. There's your passage. I got four points today. And are you ready? All right. First point is number one is God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. You know, and uh, here's Mary. She's a teenage girl at this point. She's dreaming about her upcoming marriage to her high school hunk, Joseph. You know, the, the strapping carpenter, right? And, and stonemason. And so she had a plan for her life and she was planning it all out. And then, uh, you know, but the fact is God has a destiny. You might have a plan for your life and get it all figured out. Where you're going to go to school, where you're going to work, where you're going to build your house. And You know, when the call of God comes, it often comes and it's going to inconvenience you. Maybe for you today, you thought you had it all figured out. You're getting all ready for Christmas. Let me tell you, I believe that you're here by divine counsel. You're not here by accident. And I think God is maybe going to inconvenience some of you today. Amen. So God has a, has a plan. And so uh, when we think about how God chooses people, because here he chooses Mary. He doesn't come to a king. He doesn't come to a priest. He doesn't come to a prophet. He comes to the most unlikely candidate, a young girl, a teenage girl who's planning her marriage. Angels don't appear to ordinary people, do they? God only does great things through amazing, great, you know, you know, B-mogs, big men of God, or B-wogs, big women of God. He doesn't come to ordinary people. Well, what do the scriptures say in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 28? Take a good look, friends, at who you were when you got called into this life. I don't see many of the brightest and the best among you. Matter of fact, look around right now. I don't know, maybe you don't see many of the best or the brightest among you. Be careful who you're looking at. I've heard about some of the venue people that carry weapons. Okay, not many influential, not many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses? Chose these nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies. I tell you, you are in a good place today. Maybe you've counted yourself out. Maybe nobody saw anything great in you. But I want you to know you are on God's radar. And you might say, but I'm not qualified. Listen, God doesn't call the qualified. He, co he qualifies the called. Who did Jesus chose? Listen, when you think about the disciples... The, the, the 12 disciples, not one of them came from an educated religious seminary or institution, right? They were, they, matter of fact, he didn't even start with believers. He started with unbelievers. And so if you're here today, just kind of coming to scope the place out, see what's going on. I want you to know that again, you are on God's radar. He's looking for someone just like you. He's looking for someone who's real, authentic, and not putting on a show, not wearing a mask, but it's just doing life and looking for answers and looking for purpose. And so even when you look at even all the miracles that happen in the book of Acts, there's 39 or 40 recorded miracles, all but one happen out in the city, out in the marketplace. Only one happens in a religious venue, and that's on the very outskirt of the temple at the gate. Beautiful. You have him. Why, why, why is that? Because God wants to come out of religious systems and use ordinary people and work miracles out where the people are. Come on. It's time for us to wear salvation well. First point, God uses ordinary people. All right, ready for number two? God's plan is always greater. I remember when my wife and I, we moved to Sweden. We didn't have anything. 
And so we just showed up there. I was going to Bible college. And, you know, I was, it was a terrible time of my life. And all I had, you know, to get to Bible school in Sweden was my wife's fluorescent pink girl's bike. So I'd get on this fluorescent pink girl's bike and I would ride from the apartment that we had in downtown Uppsala down to the church and I would pull up and we had a big Bible college, 1,200 students. There was 200 Russians that were there, big Russian guys. They see me coming with pink bike. They go, Anthony, you're driving. Look, you're riding pink bike. You know, I was so mad. I was so humiliated. Felt so emasculated from these Russians. Riding home one day, and I'm mad, and I'm in debt, and things aren't going well, and the Russians are making fun of me. And God says, son, just praise me. Just lift your hands and worship me. By the time you leave Sweden, you'll be blessed. You'll be out of debt. And he says, you know, I'm, 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 I'm going to bless you. So I went home. Joy filled my heart. I said, Madeline, you know, this is good news. I said, I, you know, I, I, I believe God's going to bless us. Let's begin to believe God. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. Let's believe God. And she looks at me, she goes, Anthony, what are you going to believe God for? I said, simple, big blue boy's bike. I want big blue boy's bike. I said, how about you, Madeline? What do you want? She goes, oh, living in Sweden? I want a Volvo, a 740, charcoal gray, turbo, intercooler turbo. I am like, yeah, right. God's going to give you a Volvo? I mean, we're, okay, sure. Praise the Lord, sister. Three months later, well, not even two weeks later, I'm riding the girl's pink bike into the Bible college. And they had this part of, they had this ministry where they helped out the poor Russian Bible school students. And one of the guys says, Anthony, we don't do this for Canadians because we all think you guys have money, but all, evidently you don't. Um, <laughs> and we're, we, we all feel for you. We feel your pain. And he says, come here, I got something for you. It was a big blue boy's bike. It, it was called the Flying Fin. It was made for Scandinavians, not for Southern Italians like myself. My feet could hardly touch the ground. I'd be like this at stoplights, but I loved it. I mean, I'm riding that bike and in winter, the whole thing. Well, my wife gets a job. So one day, and so I'm riding the bike in February in Sweden. I'm kicking over penguins, battling polar bears, you know. And then, and it's funny, everybody rides bikes there. So they have bikes with studded tires. I'm being passed by senior citizens on studded tires. And I'm like slipping and sliding. And anyway, so I'm telling her the story. And, and she's, she's, she's working in Stockholm. And she's in her boss's car. And, uh, and, the, and the boss was a Christian. And, and she had just gotten this job. And, 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 and the boss is laughing, saying, what's, what's Anthony doing riding a bike? bike even in winter you know and uh he calls up and uh he says meet me outside your apartment next saturday night so we we don't know what's going on we meet him outside he went and got us a car charcoal gray volvo 740 with a turbo come on let god's plan for you is always greater think about moses he sees one of his countrymen being abused by an Egyptian taskmaster. So what does he do? He just wants to save one slave. He just wants to deliver one Hebrew. But yet God wanted him to deliver an entire nation of Hebrews. I don't know. I think about Abram. He just wanted one son. God, just give me one son. And God takes him out of his tent one night and says, count the stars. When you're looking down, count the grains of sand. Because that's how many descendants you're going to be. You're thinking about you know come on what are you thinking about your life I just need to get off the alcohol or the addictions I just need to break the cycle of poverty you're just thinking about just surviving God says I want you to be more than just in survival mode I want you to live a life of significance you're going to break that chain and set the next generations free come on somebody you're thinking if I could just pay the bill to the end of the month and God's saying I want to put such a blessing on you you're going to pay somebody else's bills come on somebody I mean God's plan is always bigger than you thought you thought well we're just going to take over this part of the complex and God says I don't want you to just take over this part of the complex take over the whole thing buy this whole building in Jesus name God's plan is always bigger what are you thinking what are you dreaming about? What are you expecting? Let me tell you, God's plan is always bigger. I love the, the scripture for this one. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, but as written, I has not seen, 
nor ear heard. Ooh, I feel like I'm prophesying to this couple on the front row right now. Nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Come on, it's time to get on God's, you know, uh, pre-approved flight plan because he sure has a whole lot more for you. Mm. And he says, but God has revealed it to us through his spirit. That's point number two. God's plan is always bigger. He just want, I just want it. Man, I'm so happy when I got saved. Just glad that I, you know, I was free from being a people pleaser and just living a, this empty, lonely, you know, purposeless life. Discover purpose. God's got a purpose for you. You're not the product of some slimy snot that crawled out of a swamp that got struck by lightning. You're not a product of some evolutionary process of chance and mutation. You existed in the mind of God. There's purpose resonating on the inside of you. You are God's idea. He made you for a purpose. Woo! purpose on the inside of you even your mistakes God will use them turn your mess into a message and your scars into stars that was point number two let's move on point number three miracles happen when I finish on time it's a miracle because you know what it you know what it means when an Italian preacher looks at his watch right nothing absolutely nothing all right number three well, let me be honest with you I mean Mary, God, God's plan is always harder. I loved when you said, you know, we're a high challenge people. Because let me tell you, there's a lot of people tell you, give your life to Christ, everything is, oh, a bed of roses. I know when I, gave, when I went to give my life to Christ, you know, I'm sitting in a trailer in Cranbrook, B.C. in 1982, it was September, counting my beer money to see if I could get drunk that night. My friend's roommate came in and shared Christ with me and opened up his Bible, began to, to share this message. And, and I just thought, this is what I want. I want, I, want to, I want to be forgiven. I want a fresh start. I need Jesus. I knew it. But then I thought, what about this reputation that I've just built up? I used to always be, I don't know if you notice this, but I, I'm, I'm vertically challenged. And uh, identify as a six foot two blonde, you know, the Swede. Like I said in my church last week, I said I was born visible. I identify as invisible. I'm transparent. My pronouns are who, where? Anyway. If you get offended at that, just I'm just getting started. Just getting started. Don't worry. I got, I got more where those came from. Nobody likes a dry preacher. I remember when he was, my friend Mitch, he says, Anthony, you want to give your life to Jesus? And I remember I, everything in me said, yes, I want to. But then I thought, it's going to cost me. My family is going to think I'm crazy. My relatives are going to reject me. I'm going to lose all my friends, my reputation. So I looked at him and I said, Mitch, listen. And listen, you, you talk, this is a Catholic guy who had never read the Bible, right? I mean, we had a Bible in our house, but it was on the coffee table in the bottom shelf there. Like, we didn't even think you could open it. I thought they came from the factory like that, you know, like. So I looked at him and I said, Mitch, I may not be red hot on fire for God like you, but I'm not cold either. I'm lukewarm. Does anybody here know what scripture he turned to? Give you a hint, found in Revelations chapter 3, where Jesus said, I, I know that you're neither cold nor hot, but lukewarm, but because you're lukewarm, oh, how I wish you either hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I got saved that night. <laughs> I realized, man, it's, no, it's, not, it's not walking the fence. It's, it's not one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. It's either all in or all out, my friend. And let me tell you, if you give your life to Jesus, you're probably going to lose your friends. You're probably going to be misunderstood and people are going to look at you funny and treat you differently and laugh behind your back and think about Mary. Here's Mary. Now imagine her story. She has this incredible encounter. Like I had this encounter with Jesus. I met Jesus that night. I didn't, I didn't just simply pray a prayer or join a church or make a New Year's resolution. I had an encounter with Jesus. I remember in that moment I was like on my knees. And I'm like, Jesus. And I was like in my inside I was saying, you know, this is real. This is real. And then I heard this voice and yeah, I'm real. And you're going to tell your generation that I'm real. So I, I, I listen. 
that I get up on, like, like Pastor was saying earlier, Jesus has the ability to transform your life in just a moment. And listen, information can lead to motivation, but a revelation of Jesus will lead to transformation. And our churches need to encounter the presence of Jesus. He's alive. And so I, 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 I remember I was like, you know, where was I going? I kind of lost my spot. God, so Mary has this incredible encounter. Could you imagine her going home and here all of a sudden something got into her. She realized she, she may be a nobody. She may be an ordinary person. But God had an extraordinary plan for her life. All of a sudden she's carrying something on the inside. And when Jesus gets a hold of your life, he's got a plan and a purpose for you. Listen, if the goal was heaven, then when Pastor Corey and Pastor Aaron baptized you, they would just hold you down in that tank until the bubble stopped. Thank God they don't do that. They bring you up. Why? Because you're not just saved for heaven. You're saved for a purpose. There's a plan. God's got a, a destiny for your life. All of a sudden, you come, you get awakened to this. There's something on the inside of me. Think about Mary. Or she's a God carrier. She's carrying Christ on the inside of her. Man, there's something about Mary. She started acting different. I could just imagine her going home. Mom, Dad, guess what? And, uh, and her dad comes out. Oh, what's up? And, uh, and she goes, I'm pregnant. Do you think it was a great reception? I could just imagine her dad saying, huh? He pregnant, eh? Oh, but it's not like you think. It, 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 you know, the Holy Spirit came upon me and it was this an immaculate, you know, conception. And, and a, there's a word from God. I got a word from God. From my, I could just see, you know, Mary's dead. Bring Joseph here. I think we're going to more than circumcise him to fix this problem. <laughs> Second opportunity to be offended. Two more still in my notes. <laughs> could you imagine? Her friends and family acting like some kind of you know, cult or something. You go to that venue synagogue on Saturday too, probably. <laughs> How could you imagine her reputation is toast? You think anybody believed her? It's like when you come to Christ, I'm guaranteeing you people are gonna gonna talk behind your back. They're gonna look down at you. They're gonna, you know what? You, you, you people that you thought were your friends, maybe the ones that put the knife in your back. So here's Mary. She's paying a price. Listen, our price, the cross that we carry is not sickness. It's not disease. It's not poverty. You know what? It's, it's the identification of Christ. And we live in a very, you know, anti-Christian. You know, like, like, I don't know about you. Do you like monster movies? I love like Cloverfield, King Kong, Godzilla, Jurassic Park, Jurassic World. Anything with big monsters. I love well, on my Netflix feed came up, oh, you're going to watch Troll. You're going to watch Troll. It's, it's, a, it's a Norwegian. So I, y'all can't let this fence, y'all tell us fence. I speak Swedish. So what I did was I thought I'm going to watch it. So I started watching it. And, you know, I like it with the Norwegian language and the English subtitles. I'm not really good. It's not going to eat Norsk. not really good in Norwegian. But anyway, I'm, I'm watching this. And okay, spoiler alert. So if you're going to watch this movie, uh, the troll hates Christians. And, and it eats, it eats Christians. And I thought, this is hysterical. Of all the animals, of all, everything, the troll could be eating moose, it could be eating deer, it could be eating Muslims, it could be eating atheists. No. It can smell the blood of a Christian. And it hates the church. I just thought, it's coming. See, we were relevant at one time. That was the big move in the 80s. Let's be relevant. Let's have really good coffee, great music, dress hip, and, and, then, and, the, and, and the world would just like us. I'm so glad those seasons are over. Now, it's, listen, you know what? The world hates us, and that's okay. Because we're not called to be part of the culture, subculture. We're called to be counterculture. We live with, a, with our eyes fixed on Jesus, carrying our cross, denying ourselves, making a difference in the world today. Come on, we, we, are, we are representatives of Jesus. But that's the price you're going to pay. So, Mary, no, no one gets here. But let's get to the fourth point here because this is, this is so important. She's, She's living different. She's talking different. Your relatives are going to think you're nuts when they find out how much money you give, that you tithe and give offerings. What's gotten into you? Just a sense of destiny, a sense of purpose. I'm not here by chance, but we're, we're here in Airdrie. Why? Because there's 70,000 people that need to hear this message. I believe that there are thousands of people 
people, if they walk through the doors of Venue Church, would say, I found it, I'm home, this is, this is where I belong. But notice what the angel said to Mary. He said, go to Elizabeth's house. Isn't that interesting? Elizabeth didn't go home, did she? she? Because if she went home, it said she went with haste to Elizabeth's house. And this is, this is such an important part of the whole story. If you know Elizabeth and you know, uh, Zacharias, they're the parents of John the Baptist, their cousins, you know, to Jesus, Jesus' cousin. And uh, they were barren, they couldn't have kids. And so an angel appears to Zacharias, you know the story, Gabriel appears to him, you're gonna have a son, John the Baptist. And so anyway, so Elizabeth has a miracle. Now it's not, a, it's not an incarnation, but it's a miracle birth. So she's six months pregnant at this time. She's probably well into her late 50s or 60s. And, and uh, she's got this baby. And so it's interesting that, that the angel says to Mary, you know, you need to go to Elizabeth's house. Why? Because she's got the same kind of miracle going on. There's an affinity. And here's what's so important. you got to find that place where people get you. When you walk into a place like Venue and you say, I think God just called me. I think there's greatness. I think there's greatness on the inside of me. Something's going on. I met with Jesus. He broke the chains off my mind. I'm free. I feel there's so much more. You walk the doors and say, yeah, we get you. And we can confirm that there's greatness on the inside of you 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 got to go to a house of miracle activity don't you go to some dead church some you know boring comfortable complacent place where where where, where people just you know want you to feel comfortable in the mess that you're in you got to come to a place where there's the miracle activity we're talking about the holy ghost is listen the gospel is the power of god and the salvation i expect miracles to happen Mary, listen, God not only has a gift in you, he's got a house for you. And that word Elizabeth, it literally means, you know, that God is big or God is abundant. And so what happened is like Mary doesn't go to her own place, but she goes to Elizabeth. When Elizabeth sees her, the babe leaps in her womb. Something comes alive on the inside. You know what? You, 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 got, to, you got to have people in your life. That when, when, when they see something going on in you, they get excited. You know, they're not, they're not carrying water to your fire. They're carrying gasoline. And there's something about coming to a church that's alive. A church that's on fire. A church that gets it. I'm telling you, this is your environment. Come on, somebody. Thank God for Venue Church. Can you praise God for this morning? Because the problem in front of you is never as important as the people around you. You know, and some people think that the, the church is a museum for perfect saints. It's really a whole lot more. Maybe the keyboardist can come as I bring this baby in for a landing. And uh, minute 38 early, look at that. Now, was that for the end of the preaching or the end of the ministry or everything? I'm good, thanks. <laughs> I'm gonna, <laughs> no, I, I, I it's good. okay. Anybody getting anything out of this? If you would have told me in September of 1982 that Tony Greco in a trailer in trouble with the law, community service, probation, that somehow that God would take this young man that was so weak in himself, he was a slave to people's opinions. I was a people. I would do whatever to get people to like me. I was so bound by fear, I used to shake, tremble at night, tormented by demons. Jesus set me free. I had to quit hockey because I didn't want to do the road trips to Kimberly or Elko or Sparwood. Not that I want to go to those places anymore either. And if you've been, like, why would I want to be there? <laughs> okay, I'm teasing. Couldn't do it. I'm myself. But when Christ got a hold of my life, I understood that I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live yet. The life that I don't live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. It's Christ who lives.
this is a house of miracle activity. It'll bring the greatness out of you. You take a baby shark, they put it in an aquarium, and that baby shark will adapt to the size of the aquarium. It'll be full grown and maybe only two, three feet because it has to adapt its size. But you take that same baby shark and you put that in the ocean, it'll grow 12 to 18 feet. And I feel that I'm speaking prophetically here over Venue Church, that this is an, this is an aquarium, not aquarium, this is an ocean where the fullness of the calling and the potential that's on your life can be maximized and come into its, its full growth potential. Mm. Come on, somebody. Can I get a witness in the house? Can I get a witness in this Presbyterian church? I always... I always say that when I get a witness to Presbyterian church. And then I was meeting some new members and they said, this is the greatest Presbyterian church I've ever been in. And I, actually, I'm not Presbyterian, but you say it every Sunday, so I, I don't mean it's not a Presbyterian church. I want to clarify that. Thank you, Jesus. Destiny. God has set eternity in the hearts of men. When we speak like this, I know the Holy Spirit begins to speak. There's destiny, purpose for your life. And it's found in Jesus. The first step, give your life to Christ. For as many as received him, to those he gives the power to become a child of God. Even to those that believed on his name. I grew up all my life believing in Jesus a young Catholic boy but I never received him for as many as received him have you received Jesus have you received him because to those he gives the power to become let's do this real quick with every eye closed every head bowed I never want to ever preach a service without giving an opportunity might be one person in this place tonight you just came, you've been checking it out. Maybe you've been part of this church, but you've never given your life to Christ. I want to give you that opportunity right now. If that's you, can I lead you in a simple prayer of receiving Jesus all over this place? Just lift your hand way up high and say, yeah, preach, pray for me. Today's my day. I'm giving my life to Christ. Just put it up high and put it down again just so I know who I'm praying for. All over. God bless you over there. God bless you over there. Anybody else? Just put that hand up. All right. Can we all pray this together? Just say, God in heaven. Thank you for loving me. Come on, let's all say this. Say, thank you for loving me. Today I acknowledge my good works, my good intentions aren't good enough. So I turn from sin and I turn to you, Jesus. I receive you into my life. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for accepting me loving me i'm yours amen come on somebody can we give god praise <laughs> worship team is come on up here now let me just mention those of you that uh pray that prayer there's a prayer room at the end i want to encourage you at the end before you leave get into that prayer room and tell somebody about your decision that you made but i really feel that there's another calling that's here right now for the people that's here of in venue that you're in these seats Something started to, we were talking about, you know, come out of that grave, come out of that grave. And I, I feel a reson, something's resonating about awaken. I think there's people here right now that you're just feeling that, man, I've been awakened. I sense there's a sense of destiny and that I just want to be used by God as his representative in my world. And so there are people here today. And I just, I think, could we all stand to our feet and just for just a moment? Could we all raise our hands in an act of surrender? Can this be an opportunity where, where God invades your life and begins to enlarge you? Because the Holy Spirit wants to, just to put a multiplication on your plans and your purposes. Father, I thank you for each and every person that's in this building right now and watching online. I thank you, Father, that you've got a plan and a purpose for them. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you overshadow them right now. And that which is 
born on the inside that's born of God I thank you father that that you know it's gonna overcome the world and this is the victory that overcomes the world even the our faith so father thank you for callings thank you father for destinies thank you for purpose being awakened for awoken on the inside of each and every person father I thank you for an expansion a multiplication father I thank you and I see the day when the doors are wide open and the and there's not enough space to receive the crowds father I thank you that this becomes a destination church that this becomes a place where people are are, are gathering congregating they're just discovering life together father i speak it out in the name of jesus this building is too small it cannot contain the crowds that are coming to venue that are coming to christ through the ministry of this church father i thank you for new locations i thank you father for increase i thank you father for your blessing and your favor i thank you father for each member of the body finding their place serving together in teams with the right motives with the right spirit god i thank you for multiple Application in the name of Jesus. And Father, I thank you for people saying yes to the calling, the destiny reverberating on the inside. Thank you, Father. Let this city become the most difficult city to be lost from in all of Canada. In Jesus' name. Come on, if you agree with that, give God a shout. All yours, Pastor. Proud of the work you guys are doing.